Summary of Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Far From the Madding Crowd opens with an account of farmer Gabriel Oak, a man just out of youth who has established himself as a sheep farmer in the past year, putting all of his savings into the livestock. One day, he sees a woman in a carriage, and while she thinks she's alone, he watches her look in her mirror and like what she sees. Later, he sees her riding side saddle, which isn't very ladylike, and when he finally meets Bathsheba Everdeen, he tells her he saw her. She feels embarrassed and would rather not talk to him, but soon after, he falls asleep in his cottage without leaving a window open to let the smoke from his fire out, and Bathsheba saves him just in time. Gabriel begins to fall in love with her, and finally musters up the courage to go to her aunt's house and ask for her hand in marriage. Bathsheba isn't home, and the aunt, Mrs. Hurst, tells Gabriel that her niece has already had a number of suitors. Gabriel goes away feeling sad. But Bathsheba shows up soon and runs after Gabriel. Everyone cheers for him, but all Bathsheba wanted to say was that she can't stand it when he thinks she has many partners when she's independent and doesn't want to get married. Gabriel soon finds out that Bathsheba has left for Wetherbury. Her uncle has died, and she is going to take over his farm as the mistress. Soon after that, Gabriel wakes up in the middle of the night to find that one of his overly excited dogs has chased all of his sheep across the fields, where they have all died after falling off a cliff. Gabriel's entire life savings have been lost. Gabriel pays off all of his bills and is left with nothing. He goes to look for work as a constable or a shepherd and hears that there is work near Weatherbury. On his way to the job fair, he comes across a fire and takes care of the disorganized farmhands trying to put it out. He saves the day. Bathsheba, the owner of the farm, rides over to see what all the fuss is about. Cool and unflustered, she says she needs a shepherd and hires Gabriel. He goes to Warren's malt house, where farm workers like Jan Coggan, Matthew Moon, Henry Frey, Joseph Poorgrass, and Laban Tall often hang out to chat and talk about what's going on in town. Tonight, there are two pieces of news, Fanny Robin, Bathsheba's youngest servant, has gone missing, and Bailiff Pennyways has been found stealing. Soon, they find out that Fanny Robin ran away with a soldier in another town who was her lover. Gabriel had seen the girl on his way into town. She looked scared and desperate. He gave her some money back then, and now she sends it back with a letter telling him she's going to marry Sergeant Francis Troy but she wants him to keep this secret. In the meantime, Fanny goes to see Troy. From the outside, she calls up to his barracks window and reminds him that he agreed to marry her. He waffles for a little while, but then admits that if he did promise, then they will indeed get married. In the meantime, Bathsheba is getting used to being a farmer, even though not everyone agrees that she can do it because she is a woman. Even so, she amazes everyone with how well she does at the corn market. Almost all of the men are looking at her. Only Mr. Boldwood, a serious middle-aged farmer, doesn't notice her. Bathsheba's pride is slightly bruised at this, even though she doesn't want to be the utter center of attention. Not long afterwards, she's sitting with her servant and companion, Liddy Smallberry, and preparing to send a valentine to one of the little boys in the village, Teddy Coggan. Liddy says it would be funny to send the Valentine's Day card to Boldwood instead. On a whim, Bathsheba chooses to do so, and seals the anonymous letter with a joke seal that says, Marry me. When Boldwood gets the letter, he is astounded. After spending some time in a daze, he chooses to go to Warren's malt house, where a number of the other workers are drinking and chatting. He goes with Gabriel and asks him if he can figure out who wrote the words. Gabriel says it's Bathsheba's hand, which makes him angry and shocked at how careless it was. At the next market, Boldwood does really study Bathsheba for the first time and is amazed at her beauty. Bathsheba is pleased that she's finally gotten his attention, though she has a pang of regret at how she's done so. He decides to speak with her and asks her to marry him. Now deeply uncomfortable, Bathsheba refuses, but Boldwood insists, saying that he wouldn't dare to ask if he hadn't been led to believe that she had feelings for him. Bathsheba is unable to convince him that it was all a game, finally, she agrees to think about his proposal for a time. 
Still, she doesn't love him, but she knows she has to deal with the moral effects of what she's done. She goes to Gabriel to talk about it, but instead of sympathy she finds that he is disappointed in her actions. Bathsheba gets angry and dismisses him. Soon enough, though, Gabriel's skills are needed when the sheep get into clover and risk being poisoned. He manages to save almost all of them, and Bathsheba turns on her charm once again in order to convince him to stay. During the time when the sheep are being sheared, Boldwood asks Bathsheba for her hand again. Bathsheba says she will try to love him, but she wants him to wait a few more weeks before she makes a promise. She knows she should apologize for what she did. Thrilled, he agrees. That night, though, Bathsheba is pacing the grounds when she actually runs into a man on a path, a piece of fabric on her dress gets stuck to one of his soldier's buttons. The man begins to tease her about her beauty and charm, and Bathsheba isn't sure whether she should be pleased or angry. Upon arriving home, she asks Liddy who the soldier might be. She thinks it's Sergeant Troy, who's known to be a trickster with women, but whom she also finds charming and handsome. A week later he introduces himself to her formally, continuing to tease and jest with her. He eventually convinces Bathsheba to meet him in a clearing later that night, she does so, and he kisses her. Bathsheba falls in love with Troy, something that Gabriel sees, though it pains him. He decides to talk to Bathsheba about it and remind her that she owes Boldwood, who has been traveling, something. Gabriel makes Bathsheba angry, so she tells him to leave again, but he won't. With Liddy, meanwhile, Bathsheba moves wildly from one temper to the next, worried about Troy's character but unable to stamp out her feelings for him. She sends a letter to Boldwood telling him she can't marry him, but she happens to meet him in person the day after and he goes into a rage against Troy, who has just left town for a few days. Worried that they'll quarrel or hurt each other, Bathsheba decides she can either try to prevent Troy from coming back for a while or else break things off with him. Late at night, she takes her horse, Dainty, and goes off. But Gabriel and Jam Coggan think that the horse has been stolen, so they follow its tracks until they meet Bathsheba at the tollbooth. They decide not to say anything of it. Bathsheba is gone for a few weeks, and Gabriel's helper, Caney Ball, brings news to the farmhands that he saw her arm in arm with Sergeant Troy in Bath. Gabriel is upset and worried, but when he hears Bathsheba's voice that night, he thinks that everything must be okay since she's back home. Boldwood, on the other hand, sees Troy in town outside an inn and decides to follow him. At first, he says he'll pay Troy to marry Fanny, as is his duty, and Troy agrees, but Bathsheba soon comes to see him, and Boldwood, hiding in the bushes, recognizes just how much she loves him. Deeply upset, he tells Troy to marry Bathsheba so as to save her honor, he'll pay him for that instead. When they get to Bathsheba's farm, Troy gives David a newspaper that says he and Bathsheba are already married. Troy makes Boldwood laugh. Bathsheba soon grows upset with Troy's laziness, penchant for drinking, and love of gambling and horse racing. On the night of the harvest dinner, he ignores Gabriel's advice that a storm is coming and the ricks should be battened down to protect the produce. Instead, he gives the workers brandy until they are so drunk that they can't move. Gabriel and, later, Bathsheba are the only ones who stay up all night to protect the farm. Soon after, Troy and Bathsheba are leaving the Casterbridge market when they see a poor, dirty woman walking along the road. Troy tells Bathsheba to go ahead because he knows Fanny. They agree to meet a few days later so that Troy can help her and find her a place to stay. At home, Bathsheba finds a lock of blonde hair in Troy's watch case, he admits it belonged to the girl he loved before her. A few days later, the town hears that Fanny has died. She had walked all the way to the Casterbridge Union House and died soon after she got there. Bathsheba is troubled by this news, wondering if there's any connection to Troy. She has Fanny's casket brought to her own house, since Fanny was her uncle's helper. Marianne tells Bathsheba of a story that there are two people in the casket, not one, indeed, Gabriel had seen Fanny and Child written on the coffin and had rubbed out and Child. That night, Bathsheba is brave enough to open the box, and when she does, she sees the two bodies and Fanny's golden hair. 
Later Troy arrives and sees Fanny's body, he kisses it, and tells Bathsheba that he only ever loved Fanny, and that Bathsheba is nothing to him. He storms off. First he spends all his money getting a gravestone engraved and puts flowers around it, though the rain wipes them away. He then decides he cannot return home. He leaves and, near Budmouth, decides to go for a swim. Troy is drawn out by the current and finally is picked up by a boat. Since his clothes aren't where he left them, he agrees to go with the sailors on a six-month trip to America. Back at Wetherbury, Bathsheba has reached a dull apathy. At first, she doesn't believe that Troy is dead, as is said, but as time goes on, her doubts go away. Boldwood asks her to marry him seven years after Troy has gone missing. This is because she will not be legally a widow until then. Bathsheba puts him off again because she doesn't know what to do because she knows she owes him a lot. At the late summer fair, Troy returns as an employee of the circus. He gets sight of Bathsheba in the audience, but manages to avoid her. He gets bailiff Pennyways to join his side, and together they scheme on how best for Troy to reclaim his property, in his wife and her farm. That Christmas, Boldwood throws a big party, which is very out of character for him. As it gets closer, Bathsheba gets more and more worried. Finally, at the party, Boldwood once again proposes to her, and finally she agrees to marry him at the aforementioned date. Even though she's clearly distraught, Boldwood seems satisfied that he's gotten an answer from her, and forces her to wear a ring he's bought for her. But as they were leaving, the doorman called out that there was a stranger outside, and Troy walked in. He orders Bathsheba to leave with him. Bathsheba freezes, but then Boldwood tells her to go with her husband. As Troy seizes her arm, though, she screams, and suddenly Boldwood shoots Troy dead. He walks outside in a calm way and goes to the Casterbridge jail to turn himself in. Gabriel goes to get the doctor, and when he and Bathsheba come back, Bathsheba is sitting with Troy's head in her lap and is acting like a queen again. But when they return to her home, she begins to wail about her guilt for everything that has happened. Boldwood is initially sentenced to death, but thanks to a petition, is given a life term. Gabriel tells Bathsheba that he wants to leave the farm and maybe even the country. She grows increasingly upset at what seems to be a greater coolness from him and disregard for her. When she finally goes to see him at his cottage, he tells her that he will take over Boldwood's farm. Gabriel is surprised but happy when Bathsheba tells him that she's been waiting for him to ask her to marry him again. Even though he wants a big wedding, Bathsheba wants a small, simple one. They get married in front of only a few people, but that night, many of the farmhands come to wish them well and sing songs and play instruments on their porch. About the author Thomas Hardy's father was a stonemason and fiddler and they lived in a small town. After going to school in Dorset, he started learning how to be an architect in London, but he always thought of himself as being from Dorset, a rural, poor part of the country. Hardy's friendship with Horace Mall, who encouraged him to study and learn, began in the 1850s. Hardy began writing in 1867 after returning to Dorset as an architect. Far From the Matting Crowd, published in 1874, was the start of his success. He was able to quit his job as an architect because of it. It was also the first time he wrote about the imaginary world of Wessex, which he would continue to build on in other books. In the same year, he also married Emma Lavinia Gifford, but they never had children. Over the next few decades, Hardy kept writing books and poetry. His best-known works are The Return of the Native, 1878, Tess of the D'Urberville, 1891, and Jude the Obscure, 1895. He became more and more admired, but his views on sexual behavior and his acceptance of fate led to scandals. Hardy didn't write any more books after 1897, but he did start to work on a long epic poem called The Dynasts. Emma died in 1912, and she and her husband had grown apart by the time Hardy married his friend Florence Dugdale in 1914. In his later years, Hardy had a big impact on other modern writers like W. H. Auden, Robert Frost, and Philip Larkin. William Butler Yeats and Virginia Woolf were also among the people who went to see him. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. 
please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.